Hey there, and welcome to the virtual roundtable uh, preparing for the inevitable DDoS trends and mitigated, mitigation strategies hosted by our friends at Nexus Guard. I'm Dean Perrine, Executive Vice President of JSA, and welcome viewers to the roundtable. In this roundtable, our panelists will discuss the changing face of DDoS attacks and what you can do about them, including a comprehensive and actionable plan to both mitigate DDoS attacks and monetize your anti-DDoS solution while retaining key customers and attracting new customers to your network and services. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes really uh, quickly here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question field throughout the virtual roundtable, and we will do our best to get through as many as possible in the allotted time. We've only got an hour, so there's a lot to get through. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists and ex experts from Nexus Guard. They are Mr. Donnie Chong. Donnie is the Product Director at Nexus Guard. Mr. Xenophon Giannis, Xenophon is, or Zen as we like to call him, is the Vice President at Nexus Guard. And Mr. Alex Hisa. Alex is the Senior Sales Director at Nexus Guard. Okay, um, team, before we get started, let's go ahead and get everyone included, including our viewers, um, at, presumably at home, many of you, um, with our first poll. The first poll is this. Do you know what a bit and piece attack is? The question is, do you know what a bit and piece attack is? I will give everyone 10, 20 seconds to get their answer in here. I have made my answer. All right, we will give our behind the scenes team a look. Hey, how about that? 77% of our attendees said that they do not know what a bit and piece attack is. Zen, does that surprise you at all? Not, not at all, it's uh, fairly new, so. Uh... How, about, how about you, Alex? Is that is the 77% uh, surprising to you? No, it makes sense. Um, okay, so we're going to get to that in just a moment. I'm going to jump right into the questions. Um, Zen, we're going to go ahead and start with you. Um, where, do, where do we stand today? What is the current state of DDoS attacks? Um, all right. Th yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, well, basically, we just put out our uh, Q1 threat report for 2020, which has been a little bit um, unique, uh, which we have unique circumstances because uh, nothing's normal. <laughs> Um, but what we've seen, the patterns we've seen um, this last, uh, well, the first three months of uh, 2020, uh, because, of, you know, so the, the pandemic kind of hit right about the middle, like February, March. Uh, so what we noticed in March and April, uh, we had the most uh, um, an unusual increase in DDoS attacks that we haven't seen normally. Uh, so year over year, it was a 280% increase. And then uh, quarter over quarter, it was almost uh, from from Q3 or actually Q4 of last year, uh, almost 550 percent increase. So so that's a lot. Um, and usually Q1 is off season, so we're not really expecting um, a lot of attacks. Like people take a break, you know, after the holidays. You know, even the DDoSers don't want to be uh, hitting everybody if they if they were attacking people during uh, during all the holiday stuff and you know. Uh, uh, Christmas, things like that, things kind of settled down. Not, not a lot of, lot, lot of stuff going on. Uh, so it was unusual. And um, what we think is that because more people are working from home, uh, there's, there, you know, even the DDoSers are bored and it's just, there's a lot more uh, easy targets available. Um, now the motives, motives behind the attacks that we've seen, uh, they're usually three categories, right? So they're usually either politically motivated, um, retaliatory or, you know, some kind of organized crime. Uh, one of the politically motivated ones we saw on March 15th, the Department of Health and Human Services in uh, the United States was hit with a major attack and it impacted all their online services. And we're pretty certain that was done on purpose uh, to make a point, right? So, uh, you know, that was March 15th, right in the middle of the uh, pandemic. Their people are upset that they're not getting um, the services they need. And it was, you know, I don't think a group took responsibility, but uh, it, pretty sure it was uh, politically motivated. Um, 
uh, the retaliatory attacks can be employees or just someone that's not happy. So like I said, so maybe you could say that the, the other attack was also retaliatory because somebody didn't get a COVID test or something. And online attacks are usually between uh, the organized uh, crime. It's almost like, you know, Russian gambling rings or extortion or things like that. Uh, so something that's organized and they're trying to, uh, uh, usually it's mo monetarily motivated. Um, what we also noticed was that ISPs have now become a focal point of attacks. So uh, because the working from home is now the new norm, because uh, the trend of attacks uh, employed, um, they over, they're overwhelmingly like focused at ISPs directly. Um, and the traffic patterns that we're seeing from the ISPs is that they're having an overwhelming amount of infected devices on their network. So, because IoT is on the rise, a lot of those uh, aren't secure. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot of open resolvers on these ISPs. Now, and one of the reasons we think so is because um, ISPs traditionally, um, when you're talking about business ISPs, business network, there's a certain level of, of security that goes along with those. Uh, but now everybody's moved to the residential networks. Residential networks have a different kind of quality of service that, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, status quo, right? You're not really worried as much about, you know, uh, uptime, things like that, because it's just residential users. But now, maybe the whole C-level staff is at home on a residential network. So, um, you know, you're seeing, um, you know, there's open resolvers, meaning like DNS servers, things like that, that are there and are available to be compromised. Um, and so not only are the, the, the target of an attack, they're also being utilized to launch attacks. Um, and, um, uh, you know, an open resolver attack, which is like an amplification attack where you reflect off uh, like a DNS server, um, it can be as bad, even though it seems very small, because it amplifies, it could be uh, as equivalent of like a 57 gig attack for a two hour period. So, um, one of the other things that we've noticed, though, in general, and this is something that, you know, because you always hear in the media, uh, attacks, you know, basically attacks you know, at least one to five gigs were about 90, uh, um, uh, actually, sorry, 10, 10 gigs and below were about 98% of all attacks that we saw, right? There was some, there was a good percentage, like I guess 10 or 15% that were uh, one gig and below, but we didn't see very many that were in the ones that always make the press, right? So, uh, but just because they're small doesn't mean that they're not dangerous, right? And that's one of the things that we've noticed is people uh, oftentimes, um, uh, they discount the smaller attacks because they think, well, it's just a one gig attack, two gig attack. But what we're noticing is that that causes a lot of damage to their customers. Maybe not so much to the ISP's network, but still causes them pain because of lost revenue and customers that get upset. Um, we call that the small but deadly attack, right? So, um, you know, it's a one gig to five gig attack. Sometimes they last less than 15 minutes. Uh, you know, sometimes it's less than 200 events per day per ISP. Um, but, it, you know, we call it, it's also called an invisible killer because they, they occur daily. They're a nuisance, but they're usually overlooked because um, it's not detrimental to the ISP. And traditionally, ISPs always look for, hey, keep the network up, keep the routers up, keep, you know, don't have an outage, keep the revenue uh, flowing. But that's changed over the past five years because not so much just keep the network up, it's also keep the customer up. So whereas the network doesn't go down, the customer probably goes down, their services go down, their business goes down, and then they turn to the ISP and say, hey, what are you doing for me? You need to keep me up. If you're not going to, someone else will. Um, so, you know, and the other, the other um, risk that the ISP has is if they ignore these attacks, it still can create a bottleneck and take down some of their services. Going back to what I said earlier about the, uh, the local attacks, I mean, the residential networks, they are less resilient to these kind of attacks. So before, where a residential network was getting all these little you know, kids that are gaming, attacking each other, now what we're seeing is that you know, um, attacks against uh, the, the, these networks that are a little more sophisticated because more people are on the networks are knocking the routers over and they're having a major regional outage because it wasn't set up to be a business grade network. So it's harder to ignore these attacks. Uh, and, you know, as you have business people at home, they're expecting a better amount of service. So the ISPs have been actually very busy and scrambling just to even upgrade infrastructure, forget about DDoS, just to maintain and sustain 
uh, the the capacity they need in these in these neighborhoods. Um, um, we've been noticing that the attack for ISPs is an ongoing trend. It's going up. Um, the uh, um, uh, yeah, like I said, the the, the, the infrastructure um, it has been getting a deluge of attacks. And and the main point of this is that and that ISPs need to realize is customers are demanding uh, services that manage services that protect them, right? And that's that's the new trend, right? It's no longer, hey, what was my uptime? What's my, it's, it's look, I don't care if your network's up, I'm not up, what are you gonna do for me? Um, one of the other attacks, speaking about ISPs in general, is the bits, bit and piece attack, also known as the carpet bombing attack. What we've noticed is that um, uh, this attack has it, it gained popularity over the last 18 months. Uh, it's a very sneaky, nasty attack it really is only against ISPs. Um, and basically what it does is, this has been designed by very brilliant attackers to go below the thresholds of detection. So they know exactly where you have an Arbor device in the network that at 300 megabits on an IP number will trigger an alert. Well, what they've done is they go, okay, well, we're gonna send 200 megabits per IP number, and then we're going to uh, basically roll it across several uh, um, slash 24s, you know, so 256 IPs back and forth, almost like a sprinkler uh, that, that's sprinkling along going back and forth. They're doing that consistently. So there's two things. One, doesn't, doesn't trigger any alerts on any DDoS mitigation you have. Uh, secondly, when you do manually see it, it moves. So it's moving back and forth. So the IP number that you would have Trying to mitigate no longer is effective. It's gone over to the next one. Now, okay, 200 megs, not that much. But if you do it against, you know, a thousand IP numbers, that's a rather large attack because it converges. It still can knock out the router. It still can do uh, other things. So what it, what's been happening and one of the trends that we see is that ISPs come to us and they're like, look, my mitigation's not working. We don't understand. We have this in-house box. And the... Uh, um, uh, the reason is, is because it was designed by someone that knows exactly what they have in place to bypass everything they have in place. So um, we're seeing that uh, trending up. In Q1, we saw a total of 110 ASNs, ISP ASNs that were hit by uh, bit and piece attacks. Um, and it's just been rising. Like it's been gaining popularity. It's kind of, you know, getting out of the know now. So less sophisticated people are learning how to do it. You know, they go to that uh, DDoS webinar and they start, you know, on the dark net and start uh, learning how to do things. Uh, those are the main things. The other things, the attack sources by di distribution, obviously, <laughs> surprise, surprise, China's number one at 53%. Uh, we came in uh, at, at a low second at 13%, and then Russia um, at 8% of, of where the attacks uh, start from. Um, and then the two main attacks that we see, and really the number one is the UDP attack. 75% of all attacks we saw were UDP floods, and they were single vector, most of them. Um, the reason that UDP floods are, are, are used is because uh, they can overwhelm a target quickly, they're volumetric, but they're used as a smoke screen uh, to, uh, to mask other malicious activities. So for example, you throw a big, huge 60 gig attack at an at, at a enterprise or a network, and at the same time, you're doing a cross-site script or you're trying to hack in on the backside and trying to steal uh, either you know, in personal information, credit card numbers, social security numbers, or you're injecting uh, malware attacks into the network. And while everybody's worried about, you know, the house is on fire, you're in the back, you know, in the back door doing all sorts of things that they're not noticing. So that's that's one of the, the, the strategies they have uh, for that. And the second one, which not so big, but still 11%, that's a lot, is the DNS amplification attacks. That's the open re resolvers we were talking about, where the attack comes in, you ask for any, like you'll go into it, you're like, hey, give me the DNS for this, for, for whatever it is. Instead of just saying for one, you ask for any. So you put in one request, one, one uh, uh, packet of data, and 50 come out. And so you're able to take a one gig attack and turn it into a 50 gig attack by hitting enough open resolvers. So um, that, that's really what's been causing a lot of uh, um, problems. Now, open resolvers, if ISPs did best practice, we could, we could slow this down, but it's also something to notice. Like you could be part of the problem if people are actually able to go in and, uh, uh, you know, abuse your uh, uh, open resolvers uh, for your DNS, especially. Um, so just basic conclusions that we saw this quarter. Um, 
like I said, abnormal uh, a number of tax. We think that's COVID related. Uh, we, we're noticing that, that the, the small tax are actually causing um, um, problems that have been normally ignored. And I think that we think that DDoS uh, attackers are, are leveraging that because they know that most times they'll be ignored. So they, they, they've been uh, making them annoying, but not, not deadly. Um, and the, the, other, the, the advent of IoT devices that are continually being released and getting compromised because they're not really locked down well is also causing an increase of like new botnets. Um, the last piece is that we, we know a solution would be for all the government entities like Interpol, whatever, to get together and try to help crack down on, on some of these DDoS attacks and crime. We don't see that happening anytime soon. We don't see everyone coming together, kumbaya, let's go get all these attackers. So really it's within the ISP themselves to protect themselves and within their communities, like uh, groups like Nanov or um, you know Aaron, where they share best practice, they share information, they share blacklists, they share uh, attacks that they've seen, and then and, and, and basically solve the problem within the community because uh, if you're gonna wait for the, the, um, the police to come, you're gonna be waiting a long time. So. That's the trends that we see, uh, Dean. Thanks, Zen. That was uh, that was a very thorough uh, examination of kind of where we're at right now. Clearly, um, there's a lot going on. We're seeing surges. We're seeing lots of different types of attacks, big and small. Some of the small ones getting maybe a little bit neglected, but still very uh, you know impactful to, uh, to to folks. But what about mitigation strategies? So, Alec, as as all of this stuff is happening, you know, let's talk a little bit about what those mitigation strategies are. Um, you know, some of the, the, the more common mitigation strategies and uh, maybe a little bit about kind of the weaknesses as they exist today. Zen, back to you. Yeah. Um, well, so what I usually tell customers when they, when they ask us to do an evaluation of their network. I mean, okay, you can mitigate DDoS. There's several different ways to skin the cat. What, what, ISPs need to decide is what are you trying to protect? What's important to you? What is what are the 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 the, the valuable assets that are being protected? Is it your network? Is it your routers? Is it your infrastructure? Is your IP space? Is it your customers? Is it your customers application? All these uh, every single one of those answers is a different mitigation strategy, right? And so what's happened is, you know it, it, it's almost like the um, the firewall firewall model. It's like oh we got a firewall we're, we're covered. Well, DDoS is not the same way because, you know, whether it's, if it's a network layer attack, it's layer three, four, that, that is a much different uh, strategy than, than an application layer seven attack. Plus, if you're protecting your infrastructure as an ISP, you're concerned about your network being up, not your customers. Um, you know, but if your customer wants to be up, then you're protecting their routers as opposed to yours, as well as yours as well. So, the, the couple different, um, you know, in, in, in that light strategies, you know, there's the on-prem device, right? I got, you know, like I bought, I bought a firewall, I put it in, I bought a DDoS device, I put it in. Um, that can work. Um, the, the, the great thing about an on-prem device, it's in line, it gets good uh, um, uh, um, alerting and detection. It, it knows what's going on in the network at all times. It's fast to react. It can mitigate attacks. The problems with an on-prem on device alone is, uh, if um, uh, if an attack comes in that's larger than your upstream capacity, it's going to block upstream or your or your your um, upstream upstream providers or peers are going to block the attack, basically null route, and so you're still going to come offline because let's say you've got 20 gig attack come in and you've got 20 gigs of upstream capacity, that's going to be full. The box won't be able to do what it's supposed to do. Um, the other problem with that is you're going to need several different boxes for different types of attacks. If it's layer seven, you're going to need an application layer device uh, as opposed for, for, your, for your customers. You need a layer three, four device, like almost like an Arbor TMS or one of those for the, uh, um, for the, the, the network layer. And then if you're doing web application firewall, you need, you know, a WAF device of some sort that will uh, do all those protections. So th that's an issue. Um, there's the cloud-based only, uh, um, you know, which, uh, you know, folks like ourselves, Akamai, you know, uh, you know, tons of the new stars, they all provide a cloud only kind of solution where it's network layer and you, uh, um, um, you run a BGP, you swing over the traffic, goes to this, 
the several global scrubbing centers. In our case, we have nine. So we'd come in there, scrub the traffic. We, we, we give the clean traffic back out. Great thing about that, usually large capacity. You know, we have 2.4 terabits. That's pretty much standard people, anywhere from the range of one terabit to six terabits is what people say that they can, they can uh, uh, consume, uh, which is more than enough. Um, but the issue there, one, it's not in line. So you're, 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 there's, there's latency from detection to, to reaction, usually time to mitigate 15 plus minutes, depending on the time it takes to swing traffic, things like that. Well, I'm gonna jump into our, our next question. Um, let's talk about uh, the network versus the customer. Um, there are, you know, there are, there are common challenges uh, that I'm sure that you folks have seen for ISPs, CSPs, um, for protecting the network versus protecting that customer. Can you talk about those challenges? Sure. Well, like I was saying before, I don't know where I got cut off, but the, um, the, and, and traditionally the ISP is looking to protect their infrastructure, right? So what's, what we've seen also happening is that um, the solutions of yesterday are now trying to become the solutions for today. And it's not a very good, it's not a very good fit because if you've been out and bought a ton of Arbor in the past to protect your network uh, or any other devices, they work great for your network. They're not set up to protect your customer. Um, you know, back in the days when I was working at, uh, you know, above net, the old ISPs, we didn't care about the customer's network. We only cared about our network. We bought, we wanted to keep the network up at all costs and that's it. DDoS was your problem, Mr. Customer. You're probably, you know, a spammer or something. Well, that's changed now. It's become more mainstream and the customers are, like I said, uh, um, requiring it. So the, you know, what was a sunk cost in the past, um, the ISPs are now saying, okay, yeah, we have DDoS. Yes, Mr. Customer, we can protect you too. But it's not, it's not a very, it's not set up to be a fit like that. Yes, you're providing almost, if, you know, clean pipes. So what you give to the customer is you can say there's no DDoS on it, but it's not set up to be profiled around their around their traffic. It's not uh, it's not necessarily productized for them. So uh, you know, being able to um, go basically, you're going from being a network that has DDoS protection to becoming a managed security services provider, right? And that's what customers want. They don't want to deal with it. They want you to take care of it. They want you to have a sock. They want you to uh, you know the DDoS comes and you take care of it, and they just keep doing what they do. Um, so that's a challenge because if you're going to do it in-house, you have to buy more boxes. You have to, and most ISPs we've seen are trying to separate, right? They go, away, well, this is our network. This is the customer's network. This is the, for the, the customer product. So we have two different groups running it. This is a product. This isn't. So they have to decide how they're going to do it. They have to set up, if they, don't, if they only have a knock, they have to set up kind of a sock and it's a much different uh, game plan. You have to hire engineers that know, um, how to, you know, that are, that are relevant with DDoS, which is expensive as well. And then it takes a while to, 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 to uh, um, what do you call it, burn it all in. Um, so there's costs. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of customers, they go out and they buy all the gear. You know, they're good for their network, you know, things like that. Then they start trying to provide it as a service. Big attack comes in. They have no clue how to do it because it's something they haven't seen. It's more of a uh, customer le uh, level attack rather than an ISP level attack. So they really haven't seen it and it's a disaster. So, um, you know, the challenge is make versus buy, right? I mean, are you going to hire somebody to, to kind of do it as a managed service? Are you going to do a combination of the two? Uh, are you going to have your, your, your staff do part of it? You know, are you, can you afford to do any of it? Um, so how do you, the, the challenge is how do you stay relevant? How do you meet the needs of the customers? Uh, also, a lot of the customers now, they're moving hybrid cloud, right? They're half on your network, half on someone else's network. How do you help them uh, be protected in all of that? Because like, like I said, they don't really care what your problems are. They're like, hey, I want my network my connect, uh, protected and I want my, um, my applications protected. So how are you going to help me? Um, so that's, that's, that, that's pretty much in a nutshell the, the challenges. Um, um, and then we have some customer examples. I think actually, Alex, you have some examples of uh, some of your uh, customers in uh, Latin America that we had. You want to tell us a little about that? Yeah, sure. Zen, Zen, you're actually uh, segueing better than I could myself. That was exactly my next. We, we talk oh, about these sorry, challenges <laughs> and we talk about those, your, your partners, but how about some real world examples? And um, Alex, go ahead. Sure, sure. I'll be glad to. So uh, uh, Brazil or Latin America is is a unique market. They have 
um, a, a regulatory environment where it allows, uh, you know, more than maybe 16,000 ISPs to operate. And there's different levels of it. At the, the top level, you have the big, I would say the big four or five. And then, you know, the mid range, you have uh, a bunch of providers that are competing against the larger ones, but they also have, you know, downstreams that are service providers. They're more regional, uh, very small providers. I would say that's the rest of the, uh, uh, the ecosystem there. So the, the challenge is, as Zen was uh, indicating, is that they are trying to uh, protect their own networks, but they also need to protect the customers' networks and, and perhaps applications. So, you know, the, with the lack of expertise, uh, you know, maybe in South America, but we've seen that around the world with the lack of expertise and, you know, limited budgets just to start up a, a DDoS practice. Uh, they've turned to somebody like Nexus Guard and said, you know, what, what can you offer? Is it a managed solution? What do I have to do? You know, what, what resources do I need to start up a DDoS practice? And, and oftentimes, you know, these customers come to us because they're being attacked. So they're very, it's an emergency situation. They, they need to have some kind of protection. And I think, uh, you know, uh, we've been able to provide that type of protection and management. Uh, not only to protect their infrastructure, but to be very specific, specific and very precise in mitigating uh, attacks against their customers, which is a, a huge differentiator. Gotcha. Uh, Zen, anything to add to uh, to that? No, I mean, you know, I mean, basically, I, you know, like, like Alex said, it, it, it's it's. We're, we're seeing more and more of the customers come to us and say, hey, how do we, how do we add this? We're, we're going to lose business if we don't have it. Help us. And, and, you know, either they've tried something else or they're coming straight out of the, you know, just fresh. Because you, usually the number one thing is a big deal is on the table. And the customer saying, I need DDoS mitigation and it needs to be this. If you don't have it, you're out. And so money talks and then the executives scramble and they go, Get us a DDoS strategy so we don't want to lose this business, um, and, and and then that ends up you know driving the business. Otherwise, you know, you know, otherwise it's like okay, you know, we'll, we'll get there when we need it. But when they see the money, that's when uh, the, the they take action. Very good. Uh, also, uh, also chime in here a little bit more on we we had another uh, case study, if you will, uh, of a uh, of an ISP based in Nigeria in Africa and. You know, if you if you know the infrastructure there, uh, most providers they will loop back to London or Amsterdam for connectivity, and there's very few, if any, uh, mitigation uh, scrubbing centers in the continent. So we had uh, one of those ISPs come to us because they wanted something local. Uh, number one, the number two, uh, they needed that competitive advantage, right? You, you don't want to just be selling commodity like collocation or, uh, you know, DIA, internet access. And, and then the other thing is they wanted to have more control instead of getting mitigation from an upstream provider that is not meeting the needs. They wanted to have that type of uh, control. Um, so um, they've worked with us to implement a hybrid solution that has local scrubbing uh, and it's managed by the very capable Nexus, Nexus Guard uh, uh, Security Operations Center. And we have a really good partner that's got really good presence in, in the continent, whereas that wasn't even in, in existing until then. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, let's have a little bit more fun. Let's go back to our, our, uh, our webinar attendees with another poll question. The question is, do you feel your current DDoS security posture is adequate for not only today's attacks, but 
also for increasingly complex attacks that we're starting to see and that Zen was kind of detailing earlier. Again, the question is, do you feel that your current DDoS security posture is adequate for not only today's attacks, but also the attacks of tomorrow? Interesting, kind of split. Some 35% not sure, that makes sense to me. 35% um, no, that also makes sense to me. Um, so uh, Donnie, what do you think? Uh, does this, does 35% not being sure if their current DDoS security um, is good enough and 35% saying no, it's definitely not uh, good enough. Does that surprise you at all? Um, the no doesn't really surprise me, but I guess the, the, the group in the 35% uh, aren't really confident about you know, the existing uh, posture. And that's why they are here today to find out you know, what's the new thing that, is in, that will be plaguing them. And which, which leads us to the next point of our discussion. You know, what are the common trends and challenges that we will see that will be faced by the uh, CSP's industry in general uh, in the coming years to come? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, any, other, any other thoughts on our recent poll? Alex, what do you think? No, it's spot on. I mean, you know, the fact is it's a moving post, right? You don't know where the next attack is going to come from in what form. Uh, so, you know, how can you be you know, sure about your posture when you don't know what's coming? Yeah. And, you know, there's companies that spend millions of dollars in, in this infrastructure protection and they're still na not able to figure it out. So, yeah. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and look to the future a little bit. And Donnie, this is for you, you know, as, as a, um, a thought leader in, in the industry, you know, what does the landscape, what does the DDoS landscape look like? And, and, you know, where do you, where do you see it going? Yeah. So I think uh, Alex and Zen has touched a bit on this uh, in, in, in the earlier conversation. So what's very obvious to us and to the industry is, you know, DDoS attacks are here to stay. And not only are they um, larger than ever before, over the past 10, 15 years, they have been consistently growing in size. They are also more sophisticated and the attackers are now so innovative. Uh, rightfully, Zen has pointed out that these guys are you know, very innovative and very smart. And we see that this problem will only continue to get worse. Okay, it will get worse. And, um, and what we have seen increasingly as well is that uh, while CSP might not be the intended targets themselves, uh, because of this new up and coming attacks, you know, this innovative attacks that is crafted to take down the CSPs, the CSPs are now uh, getting more and more impacted by DDoS attacks. Uh, especially with the beat and piece attack or the carpet bomb, that, uh, carpet bomb attack that Zen has brought up earlier. So when we first discovered this attack, okay, when it first came out, it was like uh, towards the end of 2018, and uh, it's been two years now. And two years, two, two years later today, uh, a lot of CSPs are still plagued by this attack. They don't really have a solution. And uh, that's just because like what Zen has explained, this attack is uh, purposely crafted to take advantage of the, you know, the, the architecture and the design of how ISPs are set up. And then uh, of course, uh, designed to attack uh, places whereby the traditional current traditional mitigation strategies will not be able to address uh, based on all those uh, uh, the signatures of the attack. And uh, the fact is, uh, we are seeing more and more of such attack in emerging, okay? especially within the past one or two years. Okay? We've seen a lot of uh, new attacks that is purposely crafted you know, to fly under the radar or, you mean, uh, or maybe purposely crafted for a specific CSP whereby they you know, hover at the gray area where the CSPs can't uh, decide to do something about it or maybe because of the profile of the attack, they, they can't do anything much about it with their current strategy and their technology. And what this means is for the CSPs, you know, um, in the past where their infrastructures are robust, big, and attacks were small, uh, back in those days, they can largely ignore this uh, problem, you know, and then let pass that problem on to the customer for themselves to, you know, get their own solution. I think uh, with the trends that we are seeing nowadays, uh, CSPs is now forced to rethink that strategy, you know, that is no longer possible because the DDoS is becoming a problem that is already too big to ignore. That's one of the uh, 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 trends that we are seeing that we are moving towards. Excellent. Um, Donnie, let's just stick with you here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the innovations in this space. Um, certainly as the attackers become more innovative, there is going to be more innovative solutions. You know, what are some of those innovations and, you know, what are some of your, your biggest concerns about that? 
um, yeah, so um, to carry on that point, so um, we find that uh, in our conversation, so we have spoke to over the past two, three years, we have spoke to countless ISPs, you know, together with our team, uh, Alex, Zen, and the management included. So what we found, uh, what we realized is uh, most of the CSP studies are still reliant on traditional on-premise appliances, uh, you know, uh, uh, where they have acquired a couple of years back. And um, because of this reliance to these uh, technologies, okay, and these old uh, traditional approaches, uh, they are now exposed and they are left with no, uh, left clueless as in how to handle uh, the new and upcoming attacks as evident with the poll that we saw earlier, 35% uh, being no, right? So at Nexus Guard, uh, a, a lot of our micro innovations happens around the way uh, we deliver the service and the way that our partners consume the service. Uh, but I think at, at Nexus Guard, our main focus uh, in terms of innovation and our efforts are placed around uh, what we call uh, artificial intelligence and automation. So I know artificial intelligence is a big you know, marketing word and it's overused uh, very, every, everywhere. But um, at Nexus Guard, how we approach this innovation is so that we can actually keep up you know, in our business, okay, in order for our strategies and our mitigation technologies to, to be useful and be able to effectively and effi efficiently protect our partners as well, our, our customers. We use the AI and automation to keep up and hopefully be able to stay steps ahead of the evolution of these new attacks. So uh, we have taken machine learning, you know, supervised and unsupervised learning, uh, and then uh, combined it with our best traditional approaches that we have uh, experienced, that we have gathered over the past 10 years. And then uh, what we have done is uh, we have created new context-aware technologies and intelligence to enhance the way our systems detect and mitigate attacks. So ultimately, uh, the reason why we do this is because uh, in our business, uh, this allows us to deliver our solutions to our CSP partners that can use it to create their own set of managed security services and they can actually protect their own infrastructure and therefore be able to deliver a service to their end customers. And with AI automation, uh, what it also addresses, okay, what we want to address with our innovations is also to take the human elements, not completely away, but be able to scale uh, with the attacks that we see nowadays. And then of course, to keep the cost, uh, the cost of operations as well as the reliance on manpower to, to be as uh, low as possible so that you know our partners that picks up our technology will be able to you know spin up our services okay uh, very quickly and be able to pass that you know uh, uh, value on to their customers uh, uh, alongside with a, a significant amount of savings as opposed to uh, traditionally trying to set up their own service mm -hmm. So what about um, the future? <laughs> I know I, I ask that a lot, but you know, what is Nexus Guard? You know, you, you've got your eyes on the existing attacks today. You've got your eyes on the existing attacks for tomorrow, but let's look even beyond there. What is Nexus Guard's focus going to be, you know, uh, a year from now? So our eyes, okay, so uh, Nexus Guard's focus uh, has never changed for the past two or three years. So our eyes are still set on this uh, CSP uh, space because uh, like, like all the trends are pointing towards, uh, we feel that uh, the problems and all the challenges that the CSPs will be facing is going to just get worse you know, with uh, you know, 5G networks, with uh, uh, 100 g backbones uh, upgrading and stuff like that. So our focus is to continue to enhance the way that we deliver our service okay, uh, so that we can actually deliver a, a, a true and smart hybrid solutions uh, that can deliver namely three things for our uh, partners and our customers. First, okay, uh, we'll be able to deliver, uh, allow our partners to be able to deliver a seamless, you know, uh, a very simple uh, 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 to implement any DDoS solution that is not limited by a CSP network size, okay, regardless of the CSP network size and resources and capabilities, uh, be able to step into this market, okay, to immediately elevate their offering, okay, uh, uh, elevating from a traditional layer two company, uh, just prop, uh, offering uh, access and transit service to be able to uh, elevate themselves quickly to be able to deliver uh, managed security services on top of their core uh, access service. Number two, uh, with the innovations and our focus would be able to bring down significantly the cost to offer that solution, both in terms of uh, scalability and in terms of uh, being able to back up our partners in terms of mitigating the largest attack that they have yet to come. A uh, simple illustration would be, you know, a typical ISP might not have a lot of upstream capacity to be able to mitigate the attacks that we see today. 
but together with the program and partnership with Nexus Guard, okay, uh, they can leverage on our global uh, uh, distributed infrastructure to take advantage of our 2.4 terabits uh, of infrastructure as well as the other uh, uh, partners within that same ecosystem uh, so that they do not have to actually bring on those attacks themselves. Okay, uh, and it's therefore saving a lot of cost on that. And then last but not least, okay, uh, our focus is to uh, uh, create our, uh, productize our, uh, rather create our solution in a way that we help our CSP partners productize okay, and deliver a complete set of uh, solutions uh, that the consumers of the CSPs can immediately consume. You know? uh, typically, uh, uh, during our conversations with CSPs, we realize that you know, uh, when it comes to uh, having the technology within their infrastructure, that might not be a problem. But uh, to turn that into a service, you know, with all the SLA, SLAs, with documentation, with the uh, processes, you know, the best practices and everything, uh, including the services and port, you know, billing and actually uh, uh, all the other needed de details to actually deliver and service, that is usually one of the uh, main challenges that the product house within the CSP would face. So uh, our, uh, 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 our continued uh, uh, effort would be to streamline that process. And as such, uh, today, we are proud to be able to claim to any of our partners that you know the moment you get on board with our uh, program, uh, a CSP uh, that is uh, uh, only selling traditional services in terms of access and transit will be able to elevate themselves to be able to deliver to their customers a full suite of uh, uh, managed security services within a period of 90 days, okay, from end to end. So that's something that we are proud to. And of course, uh, we will work towards uh, shortening, shortening that, that, that uh, implementation period maybe even half the time uh, in the near future. Excellent, Donnie. Thank you very much for that. And team, thank you very much. Uh, we have done an amazing job of staying on task today. We've got about 15 minutes left of our time. Um, so I am going to go ahead and open things up to Q&A. If my back, okay. We do have a couple of questions. Outstanding. Okay. Um, first question, is it realistic for a small or regional ISP to have their own DDoS infrastructure? That's a great question. Alex, you want to take this one? Is it realistic for a, a small or regional ISP to have their own DDoS infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like Donnie was saying, uh, now you have this uh, program uh, where, you know, you don't really have to come up with everything yourself. You don't have to have the expertise. You don't have to have the you know, huge CapEx investment up front, and you're quickly able to launch your own infrastructure to compete against other perhaps larger ISPs in the region or even globally, right? So I think that's a, a realistic situation today. Excellent, so uh, the answer is yes, o outstanding. Uh, next question, thank you for that, Alex. Um, as an ISP, is DDoS mitigation service a sunk cost, loss leader, loss leader or, can I, or can it be a profit center? Donnie, I think you started to get to this a little bit. Um, would you uh, want to expand a little bit? Can, as an ISP, is DDoS mitigation a service a sunk cost, loss leader, or can I make it a profit center? So, um, was that directed at me? Yeah, yes, anyway, I'm sorry, Donnie, I'll, I'll for you. Thank you. So um, uh, we have a slogan, we used to have this slogan we call uh, turn business pains into gains, right? So turns your gain into business gains. So uh, DDoS, I mean, we, we're, we're in this business. So DDoS definitely has a place in uh, any of a CSP's uh, uh, core service offering. Uh, what we have seen, uh, and I'm sure CSP's feel this pain uh, uh, very uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, call the, the challenges of uh, maintaining their uh, ARPU, average revenue uh, per unit, uh, maintaining their uh, uh, revenue as well as defending their own numbers. So as uh, the CSP's product become commoditized, you know, uh, it's all about price war, uh, dollar per mag, et cetera. So one of the ways that uh, the DDoS uh, could come in as form of a managed security services to be able to offer CSP's a way to differentiate themselves. Uh, it's no, it is no uh, news that, you know, all the tier one carriers and uh, even the tier two carriers are already offering in a way, some form of uh, managed security services in form of DDoS protection services on top of that. But um, there's still a lot of uh, uh, ISPs, especially the regional carriers, uh, that are trying to uh, catch up. And 
expectation is also a thing. So uh, uh, nowadays, as customers become more educated, you know, uh, they'll be able to see the other offerings out there on the market today. And with DDoS becoming mainstream, you know, DDoS is no longer something that is new. You see it every other day on the news. So customers are now expecting more than ever, uh, you know, uh, more options, okay, especially with their current provider. So I wouldn't call it a uh, sunk cost. I wouldn't call it uh, anything else, but it, it has more or less become a basic uh, expectation of your customers. If you are not able to even offer that as a uh, offering and an option, uh, free or otherwise a premium service to your customers, then you're going to fall out of favor. Your customers are simply going to go on to the next better provider, uh, simply put. So uh, in a way, it becomes a profit center then. So you can use, if you look at DDoS as a uh, enabler, for you to be able to get into markets that you have not gotten into before, uh, that would greatly help your business. So uh, an example of uh, a success case. So uh, one of the carriers, uh, one of ISP, regional ISPs in Asia, uh, which, was, uh, which has never had a foot into the government services because they didn't have a managed security offering. So they were traditionally offering you know, broadband services, uh, IP transit, connectivity, internet access to enterprise and home users. And they have never been able to get a foot into the government services because they didn't offer any security services. And with the uh, 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 partnership with Nexus Guard, okay, with us being able to inject our technologies, process, and people into their business, uh, what has happened is uh, we've enabled them to now participate, uh, become one of the main contenders for government security services because now they have, uh, they have the ability to offer, on top of their access services, uh, managed security offerings. So uh, that definitely has brought them new revenue. So uh, that's actually a profit center for them. Uh, no. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take, we'll take one more question. All right. Here's another fun one. Uh, do you think that the advent of artificial intelligence will solve the DDoS problem without the need of human intervention? Will AI mean that we humans are not going to be uh, needed to solve uh, DDoS issues? Donna, you want to just keep going with that one? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, while we are pushing the boundaries of AI every day, right? Um, uh, personally, I, I think we are not at a stage where they can totally re replace humans yet. I mean, don't get me wrong. Okay, AI can be very, very smart. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, DDoS, when it comes to uh, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the attackers are now getting very uh, creative. Okay, and they are very innovative. Uh, and um, our SOC still plays a very important role, okay, based on their experience and then based on our uh, human's ability to react to unscripted situations are still necessary in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, design and delivery of services. Although we have taken all those aspects, you know, uh, in, in a way that our humans are uh, providing uh, a response to unscripted situations, you know, we put that all into, we pump that all those data into machine learnings and to our AI system for modeling and stuff like that. But the human factor remains a very important aspect uh, of the whole solution. And uh, the, uh, we still believe that a uh, competent SOC, SOC is, is the anchor of uh, what would make a solution reliable. Uh, and that, that, is, that is also why uh, uh, even though with our AI technologies that we are boosting it up, we have also put in special efforts to create a branch within Nexus Guard with what we call Nexus Guard Academy. Uh, that is aimed to provide professional training courses to our partners and, and their staff so that, you know, uh, we, we will together with our partners try to overcome the human shortage uh, or rather the human technical expertise shortage in the cybersecurity field. Great, Donnie. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the panelists and to the attendees. I think we, uh, we learned a lot. We probably could talk about this for the entire afternoon or evening, as it were. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to uh, Nexus Guard and to our viewers at home. Again, uh, stay healthy and be well, and we'll see you soon.